Hi, welcome to Flight Test. I'm Eric. And I'm Peter. And today we're going to be talking about servos. So what is your explanation of a servo? Uh, basically what I've seen on the internet, it's basically a means of converting like electrical signals from your receiver to mechanical motion that you can use for your airplane. All right, so first of all, I guess since we have a fairly broad topic today, we're going to cover sizes. So before anything has happened, uh, a long time ago, the first thing was the standard size servo. Those look like here. the ones I used to yeah, fly. This is like since the, like, what, how long? The mid-80s yeah, we used been to fly servos. Than that. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so you know about that. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that was a typical servo back then to mm -hmm. us. And now they started to move to different classifications too, such as the sub-micro, micro, and, well, since this is getting kind of confusing now with micro, I mean, like, which is actually the micro? Yeah, they I actually all see people, kind yeah. of micro. I see they're actually classifying by grams now. So we have like a nine gram, which is what you see in our standard packages of airplanes. So is that the weight of the servo or is that the amount of torque that the servo is putting out? That is actually weight. And we can actually verify that right now. I'll turn on the scale. And I have one right here. Okay. Actually, well, you can use either or. And we'll drop that in scale. Now they usually classify it in nine grams without the servo wire. So I'm gonna hold on to that. And that's roughly around. So about eight. So eight, that's pretty nine. close. Yep. So that's basically where that number comes from. If you ever see the nine gram or five gram or 3.7 gram sizes, that's generally what they classify it as. Okay, so are there different types of servos? I mean, obviously this is just a standard servo. Are there other types of servos? Actually, that... yes, there are. Uh, if you actually seen like the Horizon airplanes, like little, little, little very tiny microplanes, they have these linear actuator type servos. You can see a very, very small one here and they actually do this because it's super lightweight. Oh, but, and so yeah. rather than having a set of gears inside mm -hmm. that are, are turning this way, this is just a linear driven. Yeah, you can actually see there's a little screw there and basically this is like the nut and this thing slides back and forward on this shaft too. Another example I have here, something really cool, if you guys haven't seen these, this is like a Fergilli actuator. I've actually used one of these in my airplanes before. These things have a lot of torque and they're, they, they work well for some things but are bad for others because they're extremely slow. So how does this work on the inside? Is there a threaded rod on the inside yep. that's turning exactly. and then that moves this down? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's kind of like a linear actuator. Yep. Okay, and then what about this guy? This is actually something new we found from Hobby King. It's a magnetic induction servo, but we'll get to that in just a moment. I guess we kind of touched on this just a second mm -hmm. ago before we talked about the linear actuator, about yep. what's actually inside of a servo. There's a set of gears or there's a linear mm -hmm. mechanism. Can you talk a little bit more about sure. what, what's actually inside well, What better way to do is just take one apart. Okay. I've, I've actually already been in this one, so don't be alarmed if it's missing some gears or the motor falls out and everything falls apart. It's funny because I've been modeling for a very, very long time and I've never actually taken a servo apart. If I've ever busted mm -hmm. one or busted a gear, I've just bought a new servo. Yep. Yeah, sometimes it's it's pretty convenient to do for like the Turnigy like nine grams and stuff. Cause I mean, it's like what, $2 for servo? You can just throw it away and buy a new one. Sure. It's cheaper than buying a gear set and doing yeah. all that. Yeah, and that's a lot of work and mm -hmm. that seems tedious. Yep. But for some of the larger scale servos, you generally don't want to throw them away because they're more expensive. So we have a back plate here we've just removed and we're gonna pull the top part off and there's our gearbox. You can see basically what it is is gear reduction because the little electric motor in there is very bad at producing torque, but it's very good at turning very many very to low torque revolutions. Sure. So it spins very, very fast and the gearbox basically takes his, takes the spinning down. Gears it down and, and creates down. that torque. Mm -hmm. And I notice there's a bearing in the top of here. Yep. So this is actually, a, the shaft is bearing supported. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's now, a bearing servo. Are there other ones that are maybe cheaper servos that would have a bushing instead of a bearing? Exactly, yep. Just like these uh, nine gram servos, they actually don't have anything. It's just a sleeve in there. Okay, so they this, sit on the it. case actually just makes the bushing. Mm -hmm. Where uh, some of the more expensive servos are, are actually bearing supported. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, there's some dual ball bearing servos too, because you see bearing here, but usually on some dual ball bearing servos, there'll be another bearing here, but this is just a bushing, it just sits on there, just rides around. The next question I've got actually, and, and believe it or not, I actually mm -hmm. don't know a whole lot about this. It seems like you've done quite a bit of research. What is this stuff made out of? Obviously it just looks like plastic, but yep. is there anything special that- This is actually nylon. Okay. Basically nylon is, has some self lubricating properties, but they also put some grease on these. But on some higher quality servos, they have like titanium gears and some uh, metal gears and some carbonite gears. Titanium seems to be the lightest, I guess, of the of the mill. So, what what so. do you think is the strongest out of all those materials? Titanium or metal. Okay. You generally don't break those as often. You tend to strip the plastic parts of your servo horn rather than stripping the gear. Yeah. If you guys can afford them, I highly recommend getting uh, metal gear servos because they tend to last a lot longer too. You don't generally break them as often and crash. And also, if, if you guys notice it as a servo horn, and when you generally buy servos, you have servo arms that attach to the heads. Now, the interesting thing is that they're actually not all standard. Like a high-tech servo horn will not fit on a Turnigy servo. This, they're, the splines are all different, so they all don't line so up. So it's not like a light bulb where they nope. all fit in the same one. Definitely does not, does not fit. So if you guys are thinking that will work, you buy one servo thing it's going to fit, it probably won't. So now if you look around here, we have a control board here, and we also have the servo wire. Basically, you have a signal, a positive, and a ground, and the servo plug itself. Now the big question is we get sometimes in emails is, what's the difference between this and this? 
Well, this, this yeah. Yeah, this has got this little tab on the end where mm -hmm. this one doesn't. Yeah, this is referred to as like a universal style servo plug or JR style. And this is also referred to as a Futaba, but it also has a key, so it doesn't really fit. But sometimes uh, if you're in a pinch, you can take a knife and just shave that off and stick it in because it works exactly work. the same. Yeah. Yep. There's no difference in the way they operate. All right, so a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. I, I kind of, I guess I got ahead of us a little bit when I was asking what's inside of a servo. You mm -hmm. said something about a potentiometer. Yep, um, and that's is what that, the thing is right here. Okay, well, how does that work and what is that? Basically, a potentiometer is a variable resistor. Basically, it reads the position and sends it back to the board, like different resistance measurements. And that basically tells the servo output shaft to center around certain areas. So it'll just kind of go where the signal is told to go. Basically, what it does is takes the signals and sends it back to the uh, board on the uh, servo. And that gives the position feedback. Now sometimes if you notice your servos will jump and get jittery is because sometimes this, this little strip will get worn and you just need to replace your servo because it's just getting old. So obviously there's got to be a motor inside yep. of one of these and I noticed you had this laying on the table. It kind of looks like exactly. a little brushed right. motor out of a Blade Nano. And that's actually what it is. This is actually referred to as a coreless motor mainly because there's no iron core which the little uh, copper wires are wound out. So if you pull this apart, pull this thing out, pull that little itty bitty thing out there, you see this thing of just copper. Just an empty hollow copper cylinder. So that's generally just a coreless motor. There's no core. So what is a core? Actually, exactly. we're about to find out too. Okay. Hang on. Wow, that's kind of aggressive. There. <laughs> this is a cord motor. Basically, if you see the, uh, there's actually just a part of the motor there where the uh, windings are just wound around. I think it's referred to as a stator. Okay. Yep. I may be wrong on that. So yeah, comment section, point it out. You can see the brushes there too, but that's a cord motor. Now the main advantage of the uh, cordless motor is it has less rotational mass, so when the servo has to make a change, it can make it faster to the cordless motor okay, versus gotcha. the cord motor, because this is all this mass has got to spin up. And then is there anything else beside a core or cordless motor? Uh, there's one other that I've seen from Futaba. Okay. They actually have brushless servos, oh, but wow. we don't have any brushless servos right now with this because we're too cheap for that. So I was going to say, that but, sounds expensive. <laughs> yeah, you generally know how they operate. You know, we've talked all about what the servo does, how it does what it does, mm -hmm. and then you know, what's what's telling this what to do and how does that work? Mm -hmm. Obviously there's a signal coming yep. from something that's telling this thing what to do, so exactly. how does that work And exactly? that's actually called a, a pulse width modulation. Most of you guys generally have heard that one time or another. Basically your receiver sends out these little waves that controls the servo position. And actually, I made a diagram ahead of time to show you how it's done. You mentioned these waves and this is kind of a different, you know, in the millisecond, which changes the length of this, but mm -hmm. I see you have MS here and US here. Yep. What does that mean? Um, MS is milliseconds and US is microseconds. Okay, so then how does this translate into something that common folk are going to understand, like me? Because you've got me kind of lost right now. Yep. <laughs> well, basically, that's just how they're controlled. It's sure. Basically, you just modulate these little waves. This is just a little bit of a techie thing, in case you guys wanted to know just a little bit about that. Sure. We're just going to run the service here, but not go too far in depth. So basically, if you look at my computer over here, I have actually have a, uh, what is this, an Ace32 board. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's one strapped to this, so you can actually move this. You can actually see the corresponding numbers in... Uh, microseconds, move the servo. So at 2,000 microseconds, it's all the way up to the top. I pull it down to 1,000 microseconds, it's at the bottom. And 1.5 milliseconds is in the middle. If I understand this correctly, mm -hmm. like when I program an Ace32 yep. board for my copter, mm -hmm. I know that 1500 is like my midpoint, yep. whether it's digitally for my, you know, my travel adjust mm -hmm. or for a servo on a tricopter tail. So 1.5 milliseconds is basically a 1500 midpoint, yep. a thousand's your low and two thousand's your high. So those exactly. are almost like your servo endpoints and midpoint. Yep. Because okay. if you think about it, it's just like your ESCs. Your ESCs respond to the same signals that your servo does. So vice versa, I use it to control that. And okay. So time. then basically the midpoints and the low and high points mm -hmm. are how you're breaking this down with that pulse yep. width modulation. Yep. Okay, now I understand. So yep. the next thing is um, rotation of servos. Mm -hmm. So some turn clockwise, some turn, turn counterclockwise. Yep. Why, why is that? Uh, ask the makers of the servos, because the industry is actually not standardized on servo rotation according to these numbers. Okay. So that's another big thing. If you guys ever have a ready fly airplane, you crash it, you put a new servo in, Always check your control surface to which way it's going, because you could replace it with the same size servo, it looks exactly the same. But rotation's backwards. It could be backwards, and you could take off and just crash that airplane. What does this mean? Like, I see on the top of the box, there's mm -hmm. these numbers, there's HS322HD, like, is that a number for them to, like, place it on the shelf, or, like, what's the, what's the numbers I, we should yeah. be looking at, because this is full I of I think numbers. it's high-tech standard of just standardizing their servos. Companies okay. do it all different, but sure. the numbers we're mostly considering um, and are, are looking forward are specifications, because you can compare one brand of servo to the other just by the uh, specifications on the box. So there's speed, mm -hmm. um, 0.15 seconds yep. per 60 degrees yep. versus torque and so on. Mm -hmm. So 
can you explain that a little bit? Sure. Uh, why don't we start off with torque first? Okay. And basically, that's measured in, in or ounce inches, and we're gonna explain that one first. So basically, I have a nine gram server here, because I've actually always wanted to test this too. I want to see how much torque we're actually getting out of these uh, cheap Econo servos. So basically, the way to measure torque is uh, you basically move out one inch on the servo arm, and then it'll, it'll give you the equivalent ounce of thrust that it basically spec specifies on the package. So why do you move one inch? Um, I don't know. I guess it's just the industry, industry standard. Okay. Yeah. So they measure out one inch, which is the leverage from center point, mm -hmm. and then... Yeah, 90 degrees parallel to the surface, and you measure the thrust, which is an ounce. So that is one thing that is kind of standardized mm -hmm. in the industry, yep. is the way they measure the torque. And there's also kilogram centimeters, but since we're in the U.S., I'm going with uh, okay. ounce inches. So this is going to push down on the scale, yep. and... We're going to see that reading. We're going to see what we got here. So I'm going to fire the scale up. All right, so we'll put that right in the center of the scale. All right. Now I'm going to go ahead and thrust this down. Okay. I mean, look at the numbers there, you can see them going up. And you can see them slowly going down because the servo is having a hard time Maintaining holding this. Yeah, it, yeah. It's actually stalling and it's actually letting off just a tab, just touch. I've actually done this test ahead of time and actually done this a bunch of time and I took the medium of all the numbers that I've gotten because it's actually been a lot less and some is a bit more. Sure. And this is what I came up with. Three pounds, 3.2 ounces. Since this is a half inch arm, it is not the full one inch ounce. So, so you'll have to double that yep, then. You'll have to divide that or take it out, I guess. Or, yeah. Yeah. So basically you get 25.6 ounce inches. And this servo, from finding on the net, the uh, from various manufacturers, most people seem to be rating it at around uh, 24.5 ounce inches of thrust, and actually, I've got 25.6. So it's a little bit more. Here's my question mm -hmm. then. So when this thing is pushing down against the scale and you've measured out that exact inch mm -hmm. or half inch, what yep. happens when you change that? And I, because I know when the servo, if you use the inside, you're gonna mm -hmm. get less throw than yep, you do when you're torque. out. But what happens to the torque if you're farther out or farther in? If you go out, your torque drops off. So you can basically divide by the ratio of the distance you move. So basically one is one, half of that is two, so you get you double your numbers. So okay, so, you're, so as you move out away from servo center, you're gonna get more throw, but you're mm -hmm. gonna get less torque. So exactly. on a larger model, or if you're mm -hmm. up at the top of the, the rating for that servo, mm -hmm. you wanna kinda be careful about how far out you go, because yeah. you might not have enough. Yeah, you will, you will not get a lot of thrust. You will pretty much take it off. Okay, so what do these numbers tell us in the end? Actually, they don't tell us a whole lot from the from the paper paper to pencil, but if you guys are really good at this, you can actually figure out how much servo torque you need to move a surface at a given airspeed and all that. But that's getting really too scientific for a lot of us. So most of us, when it comes to picking servos, just look at what the other guy's doing, because chances are someone's built a plane with your size servo. So that's how I pick servos in house. That's how Josh. So what you're doing saying it. is, if they crashed, learn from their mistakes, from their mistakes. and get a different servo. Yeah, don't make a mistake with your airplane. And if, and if anything, just get a little bit bigger than you need to be. Don't yeah. go, don't go undersizing it, because uh, things like Josh's Kraken, you know, has a nine gram in it. Yeah. Which is and I don't that's think a that's monster size airplane. World. Sure. Especially put that thing in a dive and you try to pull up, your plane's gonna crash because yeah. the servos are gonna stall and your BC is gonna brown. And also leads us to another topic. And you're not gonna deflect the surface enough to control the airplane. Yeah, basically. I, yeah. I know tricopters are. Another thing that are mm -hmm. really, really, I would rather oversize my servo on a tricopter Always. because there's a lot of torque getting applied mm -hmm. to, or, or torsion, I should say, getting applied to that servo. And so, yeah, a, a larger servo mm -hmm. is always better than yeah. to not have enough. All right, so the other thing then mm -hmm. with servos, the, the strength, the, you know, the torque output is, is really important, but also mm -hmm. how fast this servo reacts. Exactly, if you get yeah. a really slow acting servo, You're gonna notice you know, especially mm -hmm. in a multi-rotor situation, mm -hmm. that tricopter tail's got to move really fast and react mm -hmm. quick. So how is that measured? And, and tell me about that. Basically, uh, I don't know, the industry is centered on 60 degrees a second. Okay. So that's basically how they spec their servos. The faster the number is, or the higher the number is, the faster the servo moves in, you know? You get more crisper, locked in feel for your larger machines. It's more relevant for like the 3D guys that are flying precision aerobatics or the really fast jets, or as you said, tricopters. Yeah. All right, so the whole time this thing's been laying over here and I couldn't <laughs> wait to get to this. This is a variable pitch prop and uh, sure it is. servo <laughs> controls the pitch, right? <laughs> totally. What is this? Uh, I found the propeller and I just glued a bunch of servos to it. Basically, what people, sometimes they fly and they say, hey, oh no, my plane browned out. And next thing you know, it crashes after they've done an extreme stunt or like a high speed dive and they try to pull up and the plane pulls up and then it stops flying and it just or actually stops responding to the controls and they go and plow into the dirt. And they say, my radio, is, it's the radio's fault. So actually, mm -hmm. my first guess would be that maybe the servo is drawing too much power from yep. the system. Exactly. Okay. So that's what we're going to show right now. Basically, I have too many servos. I think these things draw about like uh, 130 milliamps a piece. And we have a small speed controller here that only has probably like a 1 amp uh, BEC. Okay. And it's going to brown out these things. And basically what that happens to brown out is, is basically where the voltage drops down below a certain threshold that the receiver can't operate on that low voltage. So the whole thing reboots, shuts off. And if you're lucky, it'll reconnect before you hit the ground. So we'll might as well just show them what it looks like. So a lot of times people will blame their receivers, as you said before, and mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the issue. You've actually overdrawn your system by having 
too much pulling from yeah, that too small servo. Yeah. And you just can't you can't work it. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and show uh, what a brownout looks like. I'm okay. gonna plug this in. I'm actually gonna take some of these servos off to show you what, what it looks like first with under normal working conditions. Gotcha. We have just two servos plugged in. I'll plug this um which would be here. fine standard rudder elevator mm -hmm. bank and yank type yep. of airplane. Which is more more common for most of us that fly out there. Well, I guess bank and yank wouldn't work with rudder, but you know what I meant. <laughs> All right, cool. So now we have the system on. Basically, this is what it looks like. Servos move, and I can move them as fast as I want, and nothing happens. Now we're going to start introducing servos into the equation. One more servo. Still looks pretty good. Nothing's happening. Plane isn't crashed. DJ Peter Streeple. <laughs> <laughs> Scrub that record. <laughs> All right. So, so far, no trouble. No there's trouble. four servos, so there's but, ailerons and mm -hmm. elevator and rudder. Yep. Now let's plug in flaps. So is that slowing good. down oh, a little? Uh, it stopped. Wow. Yeah. And you have to remember, when you're flying, there's actually additional stress in the servos, too. Sure, because of the torque that's getting put on them from yep. the, the from surface deflection. Forces. Sure. Now we can do six and watch these primers go out instantly as soon as they move something. Yep. Yep. It's now out. it's not doing anything. That is super interesting mm -hmm. because I'm sure a lot of people blame their yeah, receiver blame the and reason. not mm -hmm. that. It probably happens more often than you think. Yep. My next question is going to mm -hmm. kind of go a little bit different. Mm -hmm. When And I keep going back to tricopter. I'm a huge multi-rotor guy, mm -hmm. as you guys know, so I love multi-rotors. Um, when I set up a tricopter in the NACE 32, you mm -hmm. can go into CLI and you can actually do some programming. Mm -hmm. And there is what's a, you know, there's a servo yep. PWM rate mm -hmm. that you can change. And I know that 50 hertz is at what? For analog. Yep, for and analog. And then about 100 hertz starts going going into digital. So yep. obviously there's a difference in servos mm -hmm. there between analog and digital. Mm -hmm. Which servos are better? Which servos are faster? Like, talk mm -hmm. to me about analog versus digital. Well, analog and digital, basically if you look inside these servos, they're exactly 100% the same. The only difference in them is the uh, little control board that pulses the motor and starts. Analog, as you said, is only 50 hertz, so basically it's like 50, 50 cycles a second. Okay. And these can go up to 400 cycles a second, which is much faster. Basically what it means is these servos make much more corrections much quicker than these analog servos. So they're a little bit more accurate yeah. and a little bit more yeah. precision. Basically, it's kind of like uh, little tick marks. Like, say the servo can move 50 tick marks on this board, whereas it's going to move like 100 tick marks on this board. Oh, that's yeah. kind of like being a video guy. There's 30 yep. frames per second, there's 60 frames mm -hmm. per second, and the 60 frame per second video is, is, is a lot much smoother. smoother yeah. All right, so we're going to see the speeds of which one's analog and which one's digital. Uh, this is an analog standard Turnigy Hextronic. Just like 9 gram, gram servo. Yep. Okay. And this is a digital Emac servo that we have in the shop. Okay. So basically, I'm going to power this thing up. And basically, they'll look exactly the same. They're not making any noises right now. Sure. Now we're going to start moving these things. Now, if you notice, I have this extra long little gauge thing on here. So you can actually see the deviations as they move. You can actually watch as these step across the board. Okay. First, we're going to go ahead and set it to auto. I'm going to slow it down. So what I'm noticing already, you have mm -hmm. this set on auto, and it's just kind of cycling yep. from the end point back to the other. This one is jittering a mm -hmm. lot more than this one, so I'm assuming that's where the smoothness of a digital yep. servo comes in. Exactly, yep. Basically, what this thing is operating on is 50 cycles a second, and it can only do so many pulses. It makes little pulses to the motor, and it drives the motor to get to spin. But unfortunately, it's not enough little pulses to get the motor to really want to turn. To smooth out, yeah. yeah. This one's doing so many more pulses that it gets the motor to move in a more linear fashion, and it gets it more torque, so you have more torque throughout the entire range too. Versus this one, which is a terrible torque right now, and this one is a lot stronger torque. Yeah. So now we're gonna move these little gauges into place so I can actually see how they center up each time they come back to the center. So now I'm gonna flip this thing back and forward and hit the neutral spot, which is basically 1500 uh, or 1500. Which no, is that yeah. midpoint we yeah. talked about midpoint earlier. Talked about. Okay. This nine gram actually overshoots as it comes back to center and then it runs back. And then it comes back. <laughs> yeah, you can see it sliding past and then coming back in. Yep. Now look at the uh, the digital servo. Watch how this one controls its speed and torque. Let's line that guy right up yep. there. Okay. Wow, that's a. It seems a little more crisp. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it is really centering itself up fairly accurately. Yep. And actually, both of them do. But like you said, this one comes past where this one stops dead on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's just that's just the uh, do the precision of this thing how it controls it. It speeds up and slows down with those tiny little pulses happening much much quicker. It's a lot more easier. accurate, yeah. and that mm -hmm. just basically proves the precision of a digital servo mm -hmm. over the analog counterpart. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is there's also something called dead band that we'll get into. Basically, dead band is uh, basically where the servo is almost useless because the little corrections and torque are not enough for it to deviate enough. So actually, if we do this, you can actually see how the thing works like that is the uh, little pulses are not great enough to actually make corrections for these because it's only operating 50 cycles a second. 
So you can see how that wanders. So there's a little gap in the center, mm -hmm. so to speak, where it can move back and forth, yeah. almost kind of like slop in a steering wheel yep. of an old old time mm -hmm. car. And also listen to the servo. It makes a very low frequency hum. That's like the 50 cycles thing. Yeah. Versus the digital servo, which you come over here and try to move it. Look at that. Oh, wow. Nothing, there's yeah. no slop in You get there. a little bit, but that's an Just, easier train, I can yeah. see. Yeah. And listen to the servo. Listen to how it hums. See? It's a lot higher pitch yeah. because you can hear the cycles yeah, almost between Yeah, you can hear it switching on and off real fast. Wow, that's... So, yeah. so that's basically analog versus digital. Digital, the way to go if you can afford it. And analog, it's pretty actually pretty comfortable for everything we do. All of our foamies use analog servos and it's worked really well for us. So yeah. the analog servo will work in most mm -hmm. applications. Yep. And, you know, again, comparing this to the rudder on an airplane, mm -hmm. the precision doesn't necessarily have to be there as mm -hmm. much as it does the movement on a tricopter where, where you're vectoring thrust and it can literally change mm -hmm. the way the copter flies with only two degrees. Yep. So it, the dead band in an analog servo is not going to work as well on a mm -hmm. tricopter tail exactly. or on an airplane rudder. It's probably not as, as yeah. crucial. Yeah, it's also kind of like our foamies too. Our, our foamies are fairly low speed, 20-ish miles an hour. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're generally fairly sloppy the way we build them because they're just, just, it's just foam board. But if you guys are buying a high performance airplane like a super fast jet or a very precise 3D pattern plane, you definitely want to buy the digital servos. All right, so that is pretty much like Servo 101 yep. right there. We've learned about analogs and digitals and what's inside of them and mm -hmm. standards and non-standards and speeds. Whatever. And, wow, complete that's, crash course, yeah. Yeah, no doubt. So hopefully you guys are more confused now, but, you know, <laughs> I hope you take something from this. You know, you can do a little BEC, do a little, a little bit of BEC research and pick your servos and have a little fun. It's all about experimentation. So we want to thank Little Bits for sponsoring this episode. And Little Bits are like these little modules, and I noticed that how convenient. Yeah, yeah, There's a server. Server in here. I have never seen these things actually, so Peter, I know you yeah, played with these. Know. Show me what these things do. I don't know. They I look like little building blocks, but for yeah. genius people. Yeah, you have like, listen, this is like a power uh, a power block. Okay. And this is like a, a button. And this is the servo module. Okay, what's that do? Hey, look, guess what? Oh, wow, so you're almost yeah. kind of learning to build circuit boards with power and then mm -hmm. an actuator and. Yeah, the servo. So basically. Wow. 1,000 uh, microseconds, 2,000 microseconds. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna play with these. Yeah, this sure. is Even awesome. To your kid. Well, once again, we want to thank you guys for watching and thank Little Bits for sponsoring this episode. And we hope that you know you learned a little something, learned a little more something confused. more about servos that you didn't know. <laughs> if you go to littlebits.com forward slash flight test, um, they're offering twenty dollars off your first order and free shipping in the United States. So if you guys buy one of these and you and your kids or your kids build something really cool, take a picture of it, put it up on Instagram. We would love to see it. Tag flight test in it. Um, we'd love to check out what you guys are doing. Yep, so we, so we want to thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next time. See you next time. See you next time.